Section 19 of An American Tragedy, Volume 1 by Theodore Dreiser. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Tatiana Chichilla. Book 1, Chapter 19. For the major portion of the return trip to Kansas City, there was nothing to mar the very agreeable illusion under which Clyde rested. He sat beside Hortense, who leaned her head against his shoulder, and although Sparser, who had waited for the others to step in before taking the wheel, had squeezed her arm and received an answering and promising look, Clyde had not seen that. But the hour being late, and the admonitions of Hegland, Ratterer, and Higby being all for speed, and the mood of Sparser, because of the looks bestowed upon him by Hortense, being the gayest and most drunken, it was not long before the outlying lamps of the environs began to show, for the car was rushed along the road at breakneck speed. At one point, however, where one of the eastern trunk lines approached the city, there was a long and unexpected and disturbing wait at a grade crossing where two freight trains met and passed. Farther in, at North Kansas City, it began to snow, great soft slushy flakes feathering down and coating the road surface with a slippery layer of mud, which required more caution than had been thus far displayed. It was then half past five. Ordinarily, an additional eight minutes at high speed would have served to bring the car within a block or two of the hotel. But now, with another delay near Hannibal Bridge owing to grade crossing, it was twenty minutes to six before the bridge was crossed and Wyandotte Street reached, and already all four of these youths had lost all sense of the delight of the trip and the pleasure of the companionship of these girls had given them, for already they were worrying as to the probability of reaching the hotel in time. The smug and martinettish figure of Mr. Squires loomed before them all. "'Gee, if we don't do better than this,' observed Ratterer to Higby, who was nervously fumbling with his watch, "'we're not going to make it. We'll hardly have time as it is to change.' Clyde, hearing him, exclaimed, "'Oh, crickets, I wish we could hurry a little. Gee, I wish now we hadn't come today. It'll be tough if we don't get there on time.' And Hortense, noting his sudden tenseness and unrest, added, "'Don't you think you'll make it all right?' "'Not this way,' he said. But Hegland, who had been studying the flaked air outside, a world that seemed dotted with falling bits of cotton, called, "'Hey, there, Willard. We certainly got to do better than this. It means a razoo for us if we don't get there on time.' And Higby, for once stirred out of a gambler-like effrontery and calm, added, "'We'll walk the plank all right unless we can put up some good yarn. Can't anybody think of anything?' As for Clyde, he merely sighed nervously. And then, as though to torture them the more, an unexpected crush of vehicles appeared at nearly every intersection and Sparser, who was irritated by this particular predicament, was contemplating with impatience the warning hand of a traffic policeman, which, at the intersection of Ninth and Wyandotte, had been raised against him. "'There goes his mid again!' he exclaimed. "'What can I do about that? I might turn over to Washington, but I don't know whether we'll save any time by going over there.' A full minute passed before he was signaled to go forward. Then swiftly he swung the car to the right and three blocks over into Washington Street. But here the conditions were no better. Two heavy lines of traffic moved in opposite directions, and at each succeeding corner several precious moments were lost as the cross-traffic went by. Then the car would tear on to the next corner, weaving its way in and out as best it could. At 15th and Washington, Clyde exclaimed to Ratterer, "'How would it do if we got out at 17th and walked over?' "'You won't save any time if I can turn over there,' called Sparser. "'I can get over there quicker than you can.' He crowded the other cars for every inch of available space. At 16th and Washington, seeing what he considered a fairly clear block to his left, he turned the car and tore along that thoroughfare to as far as Wyandotte once more. Just as he neared the corner and was about to turn at high speed, swinging in close to the curb to do so, a little girl of about nine, who was running toward the crossing, jumped directly in front of the moving machine, and because there was no opportunity given him to turn and avoid her, she was struck and dragged a number of feet before the machine could be halted. At the same time, there arose piercing screams from at least half a dozen women, and shouts from as many men who had witnessed the accident. Instantly, they all rushed toward the child, who had been thrown under and passed over by the wheels. And Sparser, looking out and seeing them gathering about the fallen figure, was seized with an uninterpretable mental panic, which conjured up the police, jail, his father, the owner of the car, severe punishment in many forms. And though by now all the others in the car were up and giving vent to anguished exclamations such as, Oh, God, he hit a girl. Oh, gee, he's killed a kid. Oh, mercy. Oh, Lord. Oh, heavens, what'll we do now? He turned and exclaimed, Jesus, the cops! I gotta get out of this with this car! And, without consulting the others, who were still half standing but almost speechless with fear, he shot the lever into first, second, and then high, and giving the engine all the gas it would endure, sped with it to the next corner beyond. 
But there, as at the other corners in this vicinity, a policeman was stationed, and having already seen some commotion at the corner west of him, had already started to leave his post in order to ascertain what it was. As he did so, cries of, Stop that car! Stop that car! reached his ears, and a man, running toward the sedan from the scene of the accident, pointed to it and called, Stop that car! Stop that car! They've killed a child! Then, gathering what was meant, he turned toward the car, putting his police whistle to his mouth as he did so. But Sparser, having by this time heard the cries and seen the policeman leaving, dashed swiftly past him into 17th Street, along which he sped at almost 40 miles an hour, grazing the hub of a truck in one instance, scraping the fender of an automobile in another, and missing by inches and quarter inches vehicles or pedestrians, while those behind him in the car were for the most part sitting bolt upright and tense, their eyes wide, their hands clenched, their faces and lips set, or, as in the case of Hortense and Lucille Nicholas and Tina Kogel, giving voice to repeated, Oh, gods! Oh, what's going to happen now? But the police and those who had started to pursue were not to be outdone so quickly. Unable to make out the license plate number and seeing from the first motions of the car that it had no intention of stopping, the officer blew a loud and long blast on his police whistle, and the policeman at the next corner, seeing the car speed by and realizing what it meant, blew on his whistle, then stopped and, springing on the running board of a passing touring car, ordered it to give chase. And at this, seeing what was a miss or a wind, three other cars, driven by adventurous spirits, joined in the chase, all honking loudly as they came. But the Packard had far more speed in it than any of its pursuers, and although for the first few blocks of the pursuit there were cries of stop that car, stop that car, still, owing to the much greater speed of the car, these soon died away, giving place to the long, wild shrieks of distant horns in full cry. Sparser by now, having won a fair lead and realizing that a straight course was the least baffling to pursue, turned swiftly into McGee, a comparatively quiet thoroughfare, along which he tore for a few blocks to the wide and winding Gillum Parkway, whose course was southward. But having followed that at terrific speed for a short distance, he again, at 31st, decided to turn, the houses in the distance confusing him and the suburban country to the north seeming to offer the best opportunity for evading his pursuers. And so now he swung the car to the left through that thoroughfare, his thought here being that amid these comparatively quiet streets, it was possible to wind in and out and so shake off pursuit, at least long enough to drop his passengers somewhere and return the car to the garage. And this he would have been able to do, had it not been for the fact that in turning into one of the more outlying streets of this region, where there were scarcely any houses and no pedestrians visible, he decided to turn off his lights, the better to conceal the whereabouts of the car. Then, still speeding east, north, and east and south by turns, he finally dashed into one street where, after a few hundred feet, the pavement suddenly ended. But because another cross street was visible a hundred feet or so further on, and he imagined that by turning into that he might find a paved thoroughfare again, he sped on and then swung sharply to the left, only to crash roughly into a pile of paving stones left by a contractor who was preparing to pave the way. In the absence of the lights, he had failed to distinguish this and diagonally opposite to these, lengthwise of a prospective sidewalk, had been laid a pile of lumber for a house. Striking the edge of the paving stones at high speed, he caromed and all but upsetting the car, made directly for the lumber pile opposite, into which he crashed. Only instead of striking it head-on, the car struck one end, causing it to give way and spread out, but only sufficiently to permit the right wheels to mount high upon it, and so throw the car completely over onto its left side in the grass and snow beyond the walk. Then there, amid a crash of glass and the impacts of their own bodies, the occupants were thrown down in a heap, forward and to the left. What happened afterwards was more or less of a mystery and a matter of confusion, not only to Clyde but to all the others. For Sparser and Laura Sipe, being in front, were dashed against the windshield and the roof and knocked senseless, Sparser having his shoulder, hip, and left knee wrenched in such a way as to make it necessary to let him lie in the car as he was until an ambulance arrived. He could not possibly be lifted out through the door, which was in the roof as the car now lay. And in the second seat, Clyde, being nearest the door to the left, and next to him, Hortense, Lucille Nicholas, and Ratterer, was pinioned under and yet not crushed by their combined weights, for Hortense, in falling, had been thrown completely over him on her side against the roof, which was now the left wall, and Lucille, next above her, fell in such a way as to lie across Clyde's shoulders only, while Ratterer, now topmost of the four, had, in falling, been thrown over the seat in front of him. But grasping the steering wheel in front of him as he fell, the same having been wrenched from Sparser's hands, he had broken his fall in part by clinging to it. 
but even so, his face and hands were cut and bruised, and his shoulder, arm, and hip slightly wrenched, yet not sufficiently to prevent his being of assistance to the others. For at once, realizing the plight of the others, as well as his own, and stirred by their screams, Ratterer was moved to draw himself up and out through the top or side door, which he was now succeeded in opening, scrambling over the others to reach it. Once out, he climbed upon the chassis beam of the toppled car, and, reaching down, caught hold of the struggling and moaning Lucille, who, like all the others, was trying to climb up but could not, and exerting all his strength and exclaiming, "'Be still now, honey, I gotcha. You're all right, I'll get you out.' He lifted her to a sitting position on the side of the door, then down in the snow, where he placed her and where she sat crying and feeling her arms and her head. And after her, he helped Hortense, her left cheek and forehead and both hands badly bruised and bleeding, but not seriously, although she did not know that at the time. She was whimpering and shivering and shaking, a nervous chill having succeeded the dazed and almost unconscious state which followed the first crash. At that moment, Clyde, lifting his bewildered head above the side door of the car, his left cheek, shoulder, and arm bruised, but not otherwise injured, was thinking that he too must get out of this as quickly as possible. A child had been killed, a car stolen and wrecked, his job was most certainly lost, the police were in pursuit and might even find them there at any minute. And below him in the car was Sparser, prone where he fell, but already being looked to by Ratterer, and beside him Laura Sipe, also unconscious. He felt called upon to do something, to assist Ratterer, who was reaching down and trying to lay hold of Laura Sipe without injuring her. But so confused were his thoughts that he would have stood there without helping anyone, had it not been for Ratterer, who called most irritably, "'Give us a hand here, Clyde, will you? Let's see if we can get her out. She's fainted.' And Clyde, turning now instead of trying to climb out, began to seek to lift her from within, standing on the broken glass window of the side beneath his feet, and attempting to draw her body back up and off the body of Sparser. But this was not possible. She was too limp, too heavy. He could only draw her back, off the body of Sparser, and then let her rest there between the second and first seats on the car's side. But meanwhile, at the back, Hegland, being nearest the top and only slightly stunned, had managed to reach the door nearest him and throw it back. Thus, by reason of his athletic body, he was able to draw himself up and out, saying as he did so, "'Oh, Jesus, what a finish! Oh, Christ, this is the limit! Oh, Jesus, we better beat it out of this before the cops get here!' At the same time, however, seeing the others below him and hearing their cries, he could not contemplate anything so desperate as desertion. Instead, once out, he turned, and making out Maida below him, exclaimed, "'Here, for Christ's sake, give me your hand! We gotta get out of this, and damn quick, I tell ya!' Then, turning from Maida, who for the moment was feeling her wounded and aching head, he mounted the top chassis beam again, and reaching down, caught hold of Tina Kogel, who, only stunned, was trying to push herself into a sitting position while resting heavily on top of Higby. But he, relieved of the weight of the others, was already kneeling and feeling his head and face with his hands. "'Give me your hand, Dave!' called Hegland. "'Hurry, for Christ's sake! We ain't got no time to lose around here. Are you hurt? Christ, we gotta get out of here, I tell ya!' I see a guy coming across there now, and I don't know whether he's a cop or not. He started to lay hold of Higby's left hand, but as he did so, Higby repulsed him. Ha uh, uh, he exclaimed. Don't pull, I'm all right. I'll get out by myself. Help the others. And standing up, his head above the level of the door, he began to look about within the car for something on which to place his foot. The back cushion having fallen out and forward, he got his foot on that and raised himself up to the door level, on which he sat and drew out his leg. Then, looking about, and seeing Hegland attempting to assist Ratterer and Clyde with Sparser, he went to their aid. Outside, some odd and confusing incidents had already occurred, for Hortense, who had been lifted out before Clyde, had suddenly begun to feel her face, and as suddenly realized that her left cheek and forehead were not only scraped but bleeding, and being seized by the notion that her beauty might have been permanently marred by this accident, she was at once thrown into a state of selfish panic, which caused her to become completely oblivious not only to the misery and injury of the others, but to the danger of discovery by the police, the injury to the child, the wreck of this expensive car. In fact, everything but herself, and the possibility that her beauty had been destroyed. She began to whimper on the instant and wave her hands up and down. "'Oh, goodness, goodness, goodness!' she exclaimed desperately. "'Oh, how dreadful! Oh, how terrible! Oh, my face is all cut!' And feeling an urgent compulsion to do something about it, she suddenly set off, and that without a word to anyone, and while Clyde was still inside helping Ratterer, south along 35th Street, toward the city where there were lights and more populated streets. Her one thought was to reach her own home as speedily as possible in order that she might be able to do something for herself. 
of Clyde, Sparser, Radiver, and the other girls. She really thought nothing. What were they now? It was only intermittently in between thoughts of her marred beauty, and that she could even bring herself to think of the injured child, the horror of which, as well as the pursuit by the police, maybe, the fact that the car did not belong to Sparser, or that it was wrecked, and that they were all liable to arrest in consequence, affecting her but slightly. Her one thought in regard to Clyde was that he was the one who had invited her to this ill-fated journey, hence that he was to blame, really. Those beastly boys, to think they should have gotten her into this, and then didn't have brains enough to manage better. The other girls, apart from Laura Sype, were not seriously injured, any of them. They were more frightened than anything else, but now that this had happened, they were in a panic, lest they be overtaken by the police, arrested, exposed, and punished. And accordingly, they stood about, exclaiming, Oh, gee, hurry, can't you? Oh, dear, we ought all of us to get away from here. Oh, it's all so terrible. Until at least Hegland exclaimed, For Christ's sake, keep quiet, can't you? We're doing the best we can, can't you see? You'll have the cops down on us in a minute as it is. And then, as if in some answer to his comment, a lone suburbanite who lived four blocks from the scene across the fields, and who, hearing the crash and the cries in the night, had ambled across to see what the trouble was, now drew near and stood curiously looking at the stricken group in the car. Had an accident, eh? he exclaimed genially enough. Anyone badly hurt? Gee, that's too bad. And that's a swell car, too. Can I help any? Clyde, hearing him talk and looking out, and not seeing Hortense anywhere, and not being able to do more for Sparser than stretch him in the bottom of the car, glanced agonizingly about. For the thought of the police and their certain pursuit was strong upon him. He must get out of this. He must not be caught here. Think of what would happen to him if he were caught. How he would be disgraced and punished, probably. All his fine world stripped from him before he could say a word, really. His mother would hear, Mr. Squires, everybody. Most certainly he would go to jail. Oh, how terrible that thought was, grinding really like a macerating wheel to his flesh. They could do nothing more for Sparser, and they only laid themselves open to being caught by lingering. So asking, where'd Miss Briggs go? He now began to climb out and started looking about the dark and snowy fields for her. His thought was that he would first assist her to wherever she might desire to go. But just then in the distance was heard the horns and the hum of at least two motorcycles speeding swiftly in the direction of this very spot. For already the wife of the suburbanite, on hearing the crash and the cries in the distance, had telephoned the police that an accident had occurred here. And now the suburbanite was explaining, That's them. I told the wife to telephone for an ambulance. And hearing this, all the others now began to run, for they realized what that meant. And in addition, looking across the fields, one could see the lights of these approaching machines. They reached 31st and Cleveland together. Then one turned south toward this very spot along Cleveland Avenue, and the other continued east on 31st, reconnoitering for the accident. Beat it for God's sake, all use, whispered Hegland excitedly. Scatter! And forthwith, seizing Maida Axelrod by the hand, he started to run east along 35th Street, in which the car then lay, toward the outlying eastern suburbs. But after a moment, deciding that would not do either, that it would be too easy to pursue him along a street, he cut northeast, directly across the open fields and away from the city. And now, Clyde, as suddenly sensing what capture would mean, how all his fine thoughts of pleasure would most certainly end in disgrace and probably prison, began running also. Only in his case, instead of following Hegland or any of the others, he turned south along Cleveland Avenue toward the southern limits of the city. But, like Hegland, realizing that that meant an easy avenue of pursuit for anyone who chose to follow, he too took to the open fields. Only instead of running away from the city as before, he now turned southwest and ran toward those streets which lay to the south of 40th. Only much open space being before him before he should reach them, and a clump of bushes showing in the near distance, and the light of the motorcycle already sweeping the road behind him, he ran to that and for the moment dropped behind it. Only Sparser and Laura Sype were left within the car, she at that moment beginning to recover consciousness, and the visiting stranger, much astounded, was left standing outside. Why, the very idea, he suddenly said to himself. They must have stolen that car. It couldn't have belonged to them at all. And just then the first motorcycle reaching the scene, Clyde, from his not-too-distant hiding place, was able to overhear. Well, you didn't get away with it after all, did you? You thought you were pretty slick, but you didn't make it. You're the one we want, and what's become of the rest of your gang, eh? Where are they, eh? And hearing the suburbanite declare quite defiantly that he had nothing to do with it, that the real occupants of the car had but then run away and might yet be caught if the police wished, Clyde, who was still within earshot of what was being said, began crawling upon his hands and knees at first in the snow, south, south and west, 
always towards some of those distant streets, which, lamplit and faintly glowing, he saw to the southwest of him, and among which presently, if he were not captured, he hoped to hide, to lose himself and so escape, if the fates were only kind, the misery and the punishment and the unending dissatisfaction and disappointment, which now, most definitely, it all represented to him. End of Book 1, Chapter 19